one of the examples I like of cultivating a trait, a historical example, was from William James. Many of you know, I've heard of him. Um, he, he came from a really accomplished family. His brother was a successful writer and so on. And in his 30s, he was totally unaccomplished. He wanted to be a painter and he tried that, but he kind of, that didn't work. And then he enrolled in medical school and quit to do an expedition up the Amazon and then that didn't work out. So um, he, in a moment of reckoning, he, he questioned his innate capacity to do anything productive in his life and that he should be alive at all. Okay, so he had hit a bottom and he decided before he did anything rash that he would conduct a one-year experiment. Now this experiment is an example of cultivating the positive. And here's what he decided, he said no matter what thoughts arose, he would keep turning his attention to the assumption that change was possible. In other words, he'd keep turning towards hope over and over and over again. And he tracked it in his diary, so you can read it, you know. It, he basically practiced each day as if things could get better, as if he could transform. That was his assumed lens. And he became receptive to opportunities, okay? His energy got, energy got engaged and he became increasingly aligned with his deepest interests, which he was able to discover and he married. And he ended up studying at Harvard, and he ended up creating a metaphysical club, and he, and he wrote uh, to one of his uh, partners there, he says, I possess for the first time an intelligible and reasonable conception of freedom, hope, possibility. Hope is a flavor of the ocean. The ocean has infinite potential. Our oceanness knows that this is unlimited creativity, anything can happen, we're open to it. And that's what he trained himself to do. But it was, in fact, a training. So due to neuroplasticity, we can have corrective experiences that change our brain. But how does it work? And again, I want to, um, you know, I've I'm very good friends with Rick Hansen and I recommend his books highly and he recently gave a talk that I found really clarifying on this on how learning works but he says it's really two parts you have to have an experience and you have to feel it you know, have an experience of hopefulness or of love or compassion or whatever and then you have to saturate yourself in that feeling sense for the brain to learn it in other words, it has to get installed, okay? Just like William James had to over and over again keep turning to hope. And researchers have shown, and it's very interesting, that the longer something's held in awareness, the more emotionally stimulating it is, the more neurons that fire and wire together and the stronger the trace in memory. So these two steps, have the experience and sustain the experience, and Rick says, both steps are necessary and people usually forget the second one, flattening their growth curve in life and in therapy, coaching, and mindfulness training. And we know it. We know what it's like. We have a positive experience. We'll be in nature and, be, and have a moment of awe. Or we might be with a loved one and feel very touched by something or, or witness an act of kindness and sense, you know, hope for humanity. Or in some way... But it comes and goes and we have these flitty minds that just get distracted and go on to the next thing, which is often a worry about what's around the corner. So we don't sustain our attention. The point is for our nervous system to transition from having a state of mind to creating a trait, a habit that's really deep in us of hoping, of loving, of compassion, we need to practice it. Mm -hmm.